the average Indian farmer cycling down a dusty road is incredibly wealthy versus the average American. And, and you suddenly think this is like a polar shift. And it's like, wake up. That's why I say to people, wake up. You, you need to own some physical. They now have to keep renting all we can. We've got this chicken time bomb. Talking gold, one and only Andrew McGuire. Welcome to Live from the Vault. All right, welcome to Live from the Vault. My name is Shane Rand, and I'll be your host for this episode. And from the entire Live from the Vault team worldwide, we want to just send out a quick thank you for your continued support. And as you can imagine, this community keeps growing more and more every single week. And there's a lot to talk about during these historic times. And Andrew McGuire is in the house with returning special guest, Mr. David Kranzler. And we'll be talking gold. You're going to love this. So this is going to be a great episode. Fasten your seatbelts. You know, Live from the Vault gives you access to information and updates that you just can't get anywhere else. And this episode, I promise, is no exception. And just before we get to talking gold with Andrew McGuire and special guest David Kranzler, remember, uh, keep spreading the the word about this show. Uh, Hit that like button, of course. Share this information and smash that subscribe button. That really helps us reach even more people about these very, very important topics. And then while you're at it, hit the bell right there if you'd like to be notified as these episodes go live in real time. So with that, hit it now. Okay, hit that button. Not now, hit it right now. Uh, Let me introduce our special returning guest for the benefit of our community members that haven't uh, heard from Dave before. Dave Kranzler is an MBA market analyst and author of the Mining Stock Journal. And David Kranzler spent many years working in various analytic jobs and and trading on Wall Street. And for nine of those years, he traded junk bonds for a large bank. His MBA comes from the University of Chicago with a concentration in accounting and finance. And he currently co-manages a precious metal and mining stock investment fund in Denver. And his goal really is to help people understand and analyze what is really going on in our financial system and economy. Dave also publishes, of course, the Mining Stock Journal, a bi-weekly subscription newsletter that features junior mining ideas, as well as relative value ideas and large cap mining stocks. And with that, let's head over to the UK and Talking Gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire and our special guest, David Kranzler. Over to you, Andy. Well, hi, guys. Thanks, Shane, for the introduction. But, you know, this is this is such a buzz for me to have Dave Kranzler back. And, uh, you know, this is this is really important uh, that we get together with all the things going on right now. But Dave has some very, very um, he, he comes at things from a very, very detailed way. And I think one of the things he's really well known for. Um, and if you go on his website, you can, the investment research dynamics. Uh, He has, interestingly, the Short Sellers Journal and the Mining Stock Journal, which I know a ton of people follow. And I know that um, I understand David Tice, who was on with us last week, is actually a subscriber. And I think a lot of hedge funds um, and managed money managers are subscribed to, to David. So, David, so good to see you, my friend. Thank you so much for sparing some time with us. Hey, thanks for having me back on, Andy. I really appreciate it. It's always a pleasure. So can, can you, before we get into all this lovely stuff going on, I, and obviously, look, I mean, I, I do, I will preface that with, look, no one, we're not trying to comment on the, the, the horrible war that's going on or anything like that. I mean, basically, what we're trying to focus on is what's happening to gold and and uh, the different dynamics that are happening to gold. So we're not taking sides. I mean, it's one that people know, um, but but really, this is this is something that is, we're seeing a change in the entire way paper gold and physical gold interact. Um, now, before we before we look at that, um, can I ask you to, to Dave, this short sellers journal? What does what does that focus on? I mean, it's kind of self descriptive, um, and I it was actually my first newsletter, and I I introduced it in December 2015, which was a fortuitous time. We had a big sell-off in the market in, you know, pretty much the first half of 2016. Uh, but I, you know, I basically 
kind of every issue, I summarize what happened in the market the week before, and then I go fairly in depth into the the major economic reports and, and tear apart the data, you know, and point out where there's a lot of you know government fluff in there, government generated fluff, and and um, point out you know a lot of the the data that's underneath the surface that doesn't hit the headlines that actually shows what's really going on. And then, you know, I have a core stable of <clears throat> of shorts that I recommend right now. I mean, <laughs> probably I'm most well known for Tesla, but uh, there's actually been a lot of, you know, kind of more off the radar ideas that I've been, you know, recommending as shorts that have that have performed really well. You know, like DraftKings, the, the gambling app, uh, Robinhood, the the trading app, Zillow. I mean, Zillow, pretty, I mean, it's down about 70 or 80 percent from its all-time high, and it didn't take long for it to do that. So I, I look for, <clears throat> I look for ideas, and I mean, it's like shooting fish in a barrel because there's so many overvalued companies, especially in the tech space. Uh, but I look for overvalued ideas, and then I pr make the case for why I think they're going to be great shorts. Um, one thing I'm focusing on right now that, um, has actually, it's it's stayed somewhat levitated. Surprisingly, is is the uh, home builder stocks in, in the housing sector. So, um, and I presented a, an idea a couple issues ago of a stock to take advantage of the fact that you know existing home sales, so used home sales as opposed to new home sales, are really starting to tank. And there's a lot of reasons. It's not just tight inventory. Um, and the stock that I suggested for, for shorting that, I mean, it's down like 15% in two weeks now. So part of that's the market, but part of it's just the fundamental factors that are starting to engulf the housing market. And I guess a lot of people follow you on, on Twitter as well, because you're pretty active on Twitter. <laughs> I, I saw you just followed, started following me. <laughs> just a warning, I, I, I kind of don't really have much of a filter on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a good job. It's a good job. Musk is uh, perhaps, hopefully, it's a good job that Musk is taking uh, uh, um, a, a view on maybe the, the when he he's joined, obviously become a board member of Facebook. Is he? Is, is that what it is? Facebook or Twitter? It's Twitter. 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 It? Yeah. So maybe, maybe, hey, maybe um, he, he'll allow you to speak your mind. <laughs> you know, I I'm scratching my head over you know what his motive is for for, you know, taking a almost 10% position in Twitter stock and looking to get on the board. Uh, I mean, it, you know, twi Twitter's not, it's not a high margin business. And I think there's a lot of accounting chicanery going on beneath the surface there that, that you know, that allows it to burnish its numbers that it presents every quarter. So I I'm not really, who knows, you know, you never know what's going on inside his mind. I mean, my hat's off to him because He's he's the greatest grifter in the history of humanity. So this this kind of brings us on to um, well, what I think is World War Three being played out in, in the gold market here. Um, and there was I kind of just did something on an episode which was really three things that that struck me and I'll get your, your your ideas on this. Obviously, the formal launch of what I believe is the petro ruble currency linked to gold ultimately. Um, then we have this rising ruble uh, benchmark floor elevator uh, that's been placed under the global gold price, which is sucking out paper market liquidity into the physical markets. And the other thing that we're really, that, that I'm focusing on out of all of this, these inputs is the, we've seen some recent attempts by officials to uh, intervene in the US dollar ruble cross to kind of tamp down the gold price. But how that is already failing, because the more bullion, um, the more I mean, there's a what roughly a billion dollars in uh, in oil trade flowing into Russia every day, um, something like 400 million in gas sales. That's not going away tomorrow. Um, and as much as they're throwing sanctions, trying to throw sanctions, it's not going to be very, it's very difficult to do in, in you may do it in coal, <laughs> which they were trying to get rid of anyway, but oil. What, what, what's your thoughts here? You mean in terms of, you know, what's going on with, with the paper versus the physical market, the, the ruble? Um, yeah, it's, 
in their desperate attempt to try and tamp this down i mean what, what do you do you, what are you seeing <laughs> i don't think they're going to be able to um this this is a really fascinating development to watch unfold and uh i mean i'm, I'm assuming you read ronan manley's piece yep yep very good piece when i saw that the, the funny thing about that whole situation was that at the same time the u.s congress was drafting legislation to prevent people in the united states from buying russian gold <laughs> russia <laughs> makes the announcement that its central bank will be buying gold through its banks at a fixed ruble price right remember that yep. i mean the the irony of that was palpable and the, you know again i think a lot of these sanctions that the west is throwing at russia is political grandstanding for the benefit of the constituents in these countries, right? Um, I mean, what better way for a, a failing president to get reelected than to start a war? <laughs> yes, that's so true. When I saw that announcement by Russia, I'm like, I'll be damned. They're, they're going to fix, they're going to fix the, the gold price at a fixed level in rubles. And that's going to start to reset the monetary system at some point, you know, and it's, it'll be gradual, I think, as, as it always is with monetary system resets. Uh, and then, it, you know, Ronan's piece kind of put everything, you know, together for me, you know, and they're, you know, so they're also, you know, with Russia saying that they'll accept payment for oil in rubles or gold. I mean, that essentially, that essentially kind of, connects connects the three of them and creates a pet i mean a ruble dollar right or a ruble ruble petro ruble petro ruble. Yeah. yeah and you know at the same time uh xi jinping canceled a meeting with biden and went and met with mbs in saudi arabia and they talked about saudi arabia selling oil to china for for one so now all of a sudden you have a petro yuan um and i i think a lot of the Western world doesn't really grasp what the, you know the gravity and the significance of those moves, and certainly not the, the financial markets yet. And I think when the reality hits home, I think there's a chance that we'll see gold start to go parabolic, like it did yesterday. It started to go parabolic yesterday um, before Brainerd uh, started spewing out her hot air about balance sheet reduction at the next meeting. <laughs> <clears throat> and and I think it's going to I think eventually it's it's going to have very negative ramifications for the dollar but also for the the paper gold and silver markets. Yeah, and and with Russia having sort of invoked this gold ruble ruble nuclear option but essentially um it's become really evident that the that it, that the officials are really attempting to uh, notice this. They're attempting to intervene in the U.S. dollar ruble cross. But we uh, but the blowback effect, which the only way they can fight this, really, because it's too illiquid for them to do that. The blowback effects from trying to fight an ongoing gold suppression war by selling paper gold, which is what we saw yesterday, into such a strong physical demand um, and supply shortages that we're running into constantly. It's not even realized and it's not priced in. So, as you say, it, it is a tectonic change. Um, the, 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 by pegging that price, uh, the clever part about it is this is now, of course, the oil trade. This, um, I mean, that, that, I mean, I looked at some numbers this morning and, and it was just because we were talking to um, a couple of liquidity providers and they're trying to figure out what, what are we doing here? What, what are we gonna buy? And, and really they're, they're pricing uh, they, they're, they're looking and this the reason this exchange rate is so important because right yesterday it was 83 to one uh, today 81 and a half to one it's hard to strengthen despite more sanctions coming in and what it is is that i think not not only that it's the the amount of money coming back into uh, russia in the form of gold uh, and in the form of rubles and what it's doing is essentially bolstering the the exchange rate which they're trying to attack because now most liquidity providers think it's 70 to 1 well 70 to 1 is 2200 gold so right now we did a sum and and you and i were speaking just before we both figured 
1920 is, and you mentioned that number yourself, 1920 is anything below that level. They're shooting themselves in the foot. And, and it, it's, I think that's why we're watching this exchange rate so closely. And I just did a very quick sum this morning. And, 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 and basically, uh, you know, 1925 spot. Gold was uh, 1925 spot. And the 30% discount um, that is being offered to any friend or anyone willing to use a ruble or gold, uh, or gold allowed the purchase of 25 and a half barrels of oil per ounce. Okay, so, but the, the Brent price um, was, um, was uh, w w basically uh, 108, um, and just using Brent as a proxy. Um, the price, the 30% discount price is 75. So you, you can buy 25.5 barrels of oil. And then you can immediately, this once you've sanitized this oil, goes back into the market, a round trip and an arbitrage profit of 800 bucks an ounce. Now, that's huge because we're talking hundreds and hundreds and thousands of barrels. So you can just see how as this money and gold flows back into Russia, they don't need to sell any of it because what it's doing is, bol is actually bolstering, providing liquidity uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the ruble. And it is providing... A better, a, a better and better exchange rate for the ruble, which is raising the gold price. This is a crazy situation. I, I mean, it's interesting because as we were, were chatting before we went live, and I actually, and I've taken this now back to mid-March. I mean, if, and I'm looking at the June gold future. You know, essentially, there's there's a there's kind of a the, the average price is roughly 1920. And every time it's dropped below that price, it quickly snaps back. And I think that's got to be the arbitrage effect that you're talking about, at least from the dollar side of the equation. And at some point, that floor is going to start rising because, as you pointed out, there's a, there's a lot of arbitrage profits to be made right there. And as soon as enough market players figure that out, it's going to, you know, they're going to bid away most of that arbitrage price, right? Or arbitrage profits. Absolutely, and but but it do, and, and even though if you even though you're taking account accounting for that uh, difference, these same disingenuous Western people, holier than thou people that are avoiding Russian oil, so to speak, are buying it at a premium from <laughs> from the Saudis, and paying and literally all they're doing is sanitizing it in a way that enables them to still get the oil. But it's just benefiting Russia. This is like, this is an unbelievable poker hand that's been played here. Oh, I, I agree. You know, again, I, I think over the longer term, it's it's going to have just monumental ramifications for the monetary system. And and I, you know, I mean, just to kind of talk in the abstract, I mean, I, when I first got into this sector and kind of got my arms around all the issues and, and what was going on. It took a couple of years. Um, and I mean, I threw myself, you know, reading everything I could for the better part of two years. And I had always thought that it would be China who would reset the price of gold and create a gold backed currency. Mm -hmm. Right. And they would essentially Russia is doing the same thing that I thought China would be doing, which is, mm -hmm. Hey, you're free to trade with us. But you have to convert your currency into yuan unless you can demonstrate that it's backed by physical gold. <laughs> now, imagine, imagine, you know, China saying to the U.S., well, yeah, we'll, we'll sell you this electronic stuff. But if you're going to pay for dollars, we need to come and verify that your gold is there. That would never happen in a million years. The U.S. would never let that happen. Right. <laughs> That's so true. And and the. Um... I think uh, when you're talking about China here, you're talking about, I think, look, we've all got, uh, uh, there's empirical evidence, put it this way, that, 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 that there must be, some people say 20,000, some people say 30,000. We figure somewhere between 25 and 30,000 unencumbered physical tons in the PBOC. But Russia, and, and um, based on, on three years of information that we've been getting from liquidity providers, um, we reckon it's 14,000 tons uh, for, for Russia. 
Now, it doesn't make, I mean, why not? They've been getting it from uh, Dubai. They've been getting it from Africa. They've been getting it from local production. It's been under the radar and it's been going on. So if, if even if those numbers are, are even halved, I mean, that is more physical between, and, and of course, China and Russia have an alliance, a trading alliance, and between them, their official reserves dwarf, I mean, absolutely overshadow anything that all the central banks can muster together, even the US, who has nothing but rehypothecated positions. This is an amazing, uh, this is an amazing revaluation coming up. I agree. It's incredible. And I guess just to kind of circle back, you know, to connect my story about China and what I thought would happen with China, mm. that's basically what Russia is doing, right? Yeah. They've got they've got a, a they've got energy, which essentially has it, it essentially has one hundred percent demand inelasticity, right? I mean, people are going to pay whatever they need to pay to get a hold of energy, and they're basically saying, okay, fine. You know, the U.S. wants to freeze our dollar assets and, and not allow Russia to trade in dollars. You can pay us for gold or you can pay us in rubles. In you know, either way, you got to if, if the U.S. if if uh, countries holding dollar reserves want to buy oil from Russia and use dollars, they got to convert those into rubles. And at some point, as you pointed out, the 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 Russia the, the ruble keeps strengthening versus the dollar. And, and that's where we're seeing the reset happen, because eventually it's going to take a lot more dollars to, to convert into rubles, which essentially is a monetary system reset in my book. Absolutely. And I think we're just, you know, this is just, a, it's, it, I think we're just witnessing history in the making. I, I, as you say, we all thought it was going to ultimately be China. And we thought well, maybe it's a few years out because they're enjoying this gold window. And, but Russia's been enjoying the same gold window this whole time too, haven't they? Um, they know it's been suppressed. They know the paper price is, is not the correct price. Um, and it seems like the only fools is the, is the entire Western central bankers here. Um, but I, I will say um, that the Bank of International Settlements, uh, as much as they're right at the center of everything, I think they diverged um, from uh, what the Fed is doing and I think um, by implementing Basel III, which is definitely in play, uh, other than what goes into the GLD, which is a, a joke, um, it's, it's just an unallocated flywheel. Other than that, liquid, liquidity providers tell me that when they take a spot long position, they better be backed up. Uh, and so they, what they don't square on a, on a daily basis, they can deliver. So I think, you know, I say not credit to them, but BIS saw this coming, maybe not as fast and maybe not in the same way. But ultimately, regardless of geopolitics here, gold was going to rise, wasn't it? It just it just needed, you know, a catalyst to offset the the um, massive intervention that goes on in the Western derivatives markets. Right. The the. Um, Comex Comex paper digital gold and the LBMA unallocated system. I mean, what will really blow it up. And I, I saw an article yesterday and I need to, I just kind of skimmed it. I think the, the author's last name is Vilches. It's been around a long time. And, and I've, you know, I've historically read a lot of stuff by him and he does great work. And he was talking about, we might start to see gold wars in, in the EU. That is, you know, countries need their gold that are they're being kept at the Bank of England or in LBMA bank vaults. They need that gold in order to use it for transactions with Russia, China, whatever. Or they just want to have possession of it after watching the U.S. basically obliterate property rights, right? You know, essentially seizing Russia dollar reserves held outside of Russia. I mean, that just blows up, you know, property rights law. And if, if I were running a country European country and I was keeping gold in in LBMA vaults or at the Bank of England, I would want that gold back. Yep. And the, the I, you know the article was saying there, there's going to be some real issues here if if the bank vaults in London or the Bank of England are unable to deliver that gold, which is what we saw essentially happen with the U.S. and Germany, right? Exactly what happened, Dave, when it was going to take, what, seven years initially to return 300 tons? 
Yeah, but they originally wanted plane at the time. Like 650 tons back, <laughs> and they negotiated. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. But I mean, it was like seven years. Yeah. I mean, initially, I mean, we all thought, no, 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 that's a typo. That cannot be real. I mean, that, as you say, that's more than empirical evidence. That that's blatantly yeah. obvious. That that all their reserves. That then it throws into question the. Uh, the, the quality of those reserves and whether they they must be extremely rehypothecated. But to draw that much media attention onto onto the fact they were failing to deliver, and even if you remember, they they refused to allow an inspection. Of all. Yes, I remember that. <laughs> That's what triggered the repatriation. Yeah, <laughs> remember that vividly. <laughs> Absolutely. So so you're right. I mean, it's it's. Um, you know, who's got the gold really has the power because, as you say, really, we all, we all know and we're all on the same side here. You know, uh, fiat, fiat currencies are worthless. There's only and, and Putin came out. Look, I'm not taking sides here, but Putin came out and said, you pay me in real money. Real money is gold. And, and um, that's it. Or, 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 or a physical commodity. Um, that's it. That's that's real money. Right. So I was going to ask you. Any th views on, and I've got some thoughts on it myself, but, but what are your views on, you know, this nickel trade blow up in the LME? Now, have you, if you looked at that, I mean, you must have looked at that. I mean, yeah, I'm, you know, I haven't, you know, I haven't scrutinized all the details, but I know, you know, what, what went down. Okay. And I think what I'm trying to do is bring silver into focus here because I think what came out um, of that was that the LME <laughs> exposed the fact they didn't know that the all the short positions behind this unreported short positions were in the over-the-counter market. And that's kind of like pulled a massive rock off what is just a festering amount of trouble in the over-the-counter market where, okay, that's just in the nickel market. But the over-the-counter market is now being questioned by the uh, by the Bank of England and the FCA. And I remember we had this meeting with uh, our MP who went to, to uh, Parliament. Uh, this was seven months before the March 2020 blow-up. And we went into Parliament. It was read in Parliament. I met with Andrew Bailey, who was head of the FCA and the um, govern current governor of the Bank of England. And we sat in the room and, and, and said, he said, what should we be looking at? And so the one thing you should look at is the e, this EFP mechanism where you can take a COMEX position, uh, transit it over to the over-the-counter market, and then keep rolling that forward position over uh, in less than 13, as long as it's not more than 14 days or so. And he said, oh, well, it's an unregulated market. Yeah, exactly. So, but what, what I'm trying to get at is that while they kind of, started i think that was one of the things that forced um the the the, the basel three rules to start to come in because it exposed the bank the too big to fail banks to clearly to a massive issue and so i think that was the side one of the things that helped bring basel three in on on january even though it was ignored it was actually removed from all other aspects except gold which is exposed to a multi-trillion dollar FX market. So, but I think what I'm, what I'm saying here is, interesting thing about this is that the, it's the over-the-counter market that is the issue here with the big silver short and, and the big silver short reported on in the, OT, in the OCC report. And, and so suddenly there's a light being shone on all unbacked over-the-counter derivative bets and who's backing them what's who's behind it and so the lme is now forcing every transaction uh, to be to to force the disclosure of the other party which is starting to be the first time we've ever seen any form of transparency but it it shines a light on what's going on in the over-the-counter market for the for the long the long long hedges for the short comex shorts in silver particularly in silver but in gold but um and i think this is a this is something which not really many people are looking at this yet but it, it, people are saying oh yeah it's just nickel it, base metals yeah jp morgan's getting out of base metals 
my, my information is that they they actually want to call their leases back in from in the silver market. That that is something the information we got on Monday. It is unconfirmed, but that's something that would make sense because you would never have forecast this. This is unprecedented what's happened uh, to the commodity markets now. Who the hell would want to be short silver? Well, I mean, we knew this was going to happen. It was just a matter of time. I mean, you know, and to your point about the opacity of the the over-the-counter derivatives market, I mean, that's 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 just it's a radioactive viper's nest essentially. And but you don't even have to look to that to see the massive imbalance between how fraudulent these markets are because of the massive imbalance between the derivatives outstanding versus the amount of underlying physical that can be delivered. You can just look at the COMEX, you know, and then you layer in the, L I mean, look at the, the volume of LBMA forwards that are cleared every day versus the amount of gold or silver sitting in the vaults. I mean, that alone is enough to to blow up the, the scheme, the derivative scheme. And I, you know, I'd always in the back of my mind was wondering how Russia and China were going to do it because I knew that the U.S. wouldn't let them do it on the COMEX. I mean, we saw what happened to the Hump Brothers, you know, and that's just the Hump Brothers. So, um, you know, again, I think it kind of points to, and again, I'm not taking sides here. I mean, it's going to have horrible ramifications for lifestyle in the U.S. I'm not taking sides here with Putin, but it certainly shows how well thought out his game plan is. Um, and then you've got just in the just in the U.S. the over-the-counter gold and silver derivatives market, right? I mean, we have no idea who the counterparties are on that trade, and there's no way in hell the CFTC or the SEC is ever going to make these banks disclose. I mean, it, as you point out, I mean, well, we saw what happened with over-the-counter derivatives in 2008, right? And that was just that was just mm -hmm. the mortgage market for the most part. Yeah. You know, and now you've now you've got, you know, you've got the same type of problem as you point out in the commodities market you know the base metals gold and silver silver is especially acute because you know it's such a tiny market and i mean where are they going to source the amount of physical silver that would need to be sourced if the counterparties say hey you know what this time i don't want to settle in dollars or i don't want to settle in euros or pounds I want to settle in the physical metal. Please deliver this. Here's the address of my vault. I'm not going to, I don't want you to move it around to another part of your vault and say that it's mine. I want to actually be able to hold it. What, what happens? I mean, we saw what happens with the nickel market, and that's just a microcosm. Uh, absolutely. And I, I think that, that, that is what it's, I think it's an unwanted exposure of, of, of just how dangerous this could be. And, and if it was a slightly bigger market, um, how that could implode the two big to fail banks who are taxpayer funded. I mean, for God's sake, you know, this is I think that's the one advantage in the UK we have is that it was questioned in Parliament on the basis that we've bailed these banks out once before. Um, we cannot be seen to be bailing them out again. And I think it's that side of the trade, which is and of course, that will pretty much all happens in this on this side of the Atlantic, the over the counter trade. Um, that that is is the Achilles heel, I think, of of this whole paper market. What one what it says like a one quadrillion of derivatives floating out there somewhere in one form or another. Who's on the other side of that trade? The nickel market was, as you say, a tiny tiny example. <laughs> I I mean, again, the 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 um, lack of identity in the mark in this market. I mean, we saw in two thousand eight Goldman Sachs was they were basically they were going to go out of business if they did not get bailed out they were going to blow up <laughs> you know and goldman sachs of all people you know but u.s taxpayers and the federal reserve bailed out aig and goldman sachs everyone points to lehman as being the catalyst to the you know the problem well no it was goldman sachs it was morgan Stanley. it was citibank you know and 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 now i mean you know, the, to the extent that the derivatives, the derivatives market, the OTC derivatives market is the Achilles heel of this Ponzi scheme. The silver derivatives market is the Achilles heel of the Achilles heel. <laughs> you 
if you will. Yeah, and, and uh, this is it. That's what's happening. And I think we, we've, um, you know, whereas you might have had um, no enemy of, of Russia, no enemy of China sitting back, taking, enjoying the, the paper discount, enjoying that gold window is still opened and they're seeing this gold window and they're taking physical, taking physical, building massive reserves. Uh, while the fools on 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 the U.S. side of the of, of the of the equation, uh, I mean, Europe at least has has accrued some form of physical to back their currency. I'm mean, not saying it backed, but they have some form of physical. Uh, Europeans, because of uh, war conditions, so Second World War conditions, they're, they're much more acclimatized to go. But but as you know, I wonder how many how many people other, no, in your sphere, everyone is loaded with this physical gold and silver. But outside of that sphere. I mean, how many, what does the average American person own in gold? Do they even know what it is other than a ring? Less than 1%. Uh, you know, I would say that, you know, my my friends here, you know, the people that I socialize with, play tennis with, whatever, you know, they're, we don't even talk about this stuff. I, I wouldn't even want to spring it on them because they think I'm, you know, a space alien <laughs> coming to, to deliver conspiracy theories. They, they have no idea. <laughs> No idea. <laughs> they don't, you know, I, less than 1% of, of the U.S. citizens own physical metal. You know, and, you know, if you ask, sometimes if you ask guys, hey, do you, you own any gold? Yeah, I got GLD, you know, and then it's just like, I don't even bother Whoa. discussing it. <laughs> yeah. You know, you really yeah. don't have gold. <laughs> then you really get into trouble, don't you, Dave, when you tell yeah. them they and don't have anything. if you manage anything. to sell GLD before it blows up, what's going to end up in your stock account? more fiat dollars <laughs> you don't own gold <laughs> <laughs> well you know i think that the one thing that kind of strikes me all the time is is that because as i say the average i'm looking at the average american now and 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 of course it goes globally but you know but when you when there is a price gold price revaluation which is coming it, it has to come right so the lopsided balance now is all the physical is with basically 80 20 rule it's all with russia china and their friends um okay so what happens when gold is six seven eight nine ten thousand what whatever just a, a, a much higher price the average indian farmer cycling down a dusty road is incredibly wealthy versus the average american and and you suddenly think this is like a polar shift and it's like wake up that's why i say to people wake up you, you need to own some physical but make sure it's physical but it's amazing to me how 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 can people get it that wrong it's you know what i mean it's i can speak to what goes on or what has gone on in, in the united states i mean clearly as you pointed out you know as a result of world war ii and even world, world war one in Europe, the citizens are a little more attuned to what's going on, but they're, I mean, for the most part, they, they're probably brain dead also. They've been, you know, they've been brainwashed. But, uh, you know, ever since, ever since uh, essentially Nixon, you know, tore up the Bretton Woods Agreement, there's, there has not been any effort at all in this country to educate people about the difference between gold, r real money, and fiat currency. So people people think you know people think that the dollars that they hold in their pocket they think that's money it's not it's a debt instrument right it's a debt instrument and the counterparty to that debt instrument is the U.S. government mm -hmm. you know and so like you know I went to the University of Chicago Business School from eighty nine to ninety one and I you know I'm taking these finance courses from guys who were part of you know the group of PhDs who invented modern finance. We never talked about gold. It was never mentioned. So, you know, the bulk of the people in this country just never bothered to educate themselves. I think they just assumed, you know, there's a sense of entitlement here. Yeah, as long as I got dollars in my pocket, walking around money and dollars in the bank account, you know, I've got wealth. Well, no, you don't. And you point out, you know, what's going to happen, you know, when gold goes to five, six, seven thousand dollars an ounce? Well. You're talking about measuring the price of gold in terms of the number of dollars that it takes. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the counterpart to that to that dynamic is that the dollar has become less and less or more and more worthless. 
And essentially what it's going to do is if you basically said, you know, that the U.S. scheme where, uh, you know, you got a strong dollar policy and you, you issue debt and that basically pays for your, your um, current account deficit, your trade deficit, it's essentially been a way to um, pull, you know, transfer wealth from the rest of the world into the United States. Well, now what's going to happen is, as as the price of gold goes up, and as as um, you know the, the 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 scheme not I wouldn't I don't want to call it a scheme, but the system that kind of Russia with China in the background have set up, you're, that wealth that's been transferred into the United States is going to get sucked right back out, right? And even if you're a millionaire, you know if you're if the standard of measuring the value of your currency is gold or or energy. You know, your dollars aren't mm -hmm. worth very much anymore. And it's, it's going, like I said, it's going to make uh, living conditions for people in this country extremely difficult. Certainly, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's going to create living conditions that no one in this country has been used to since World War, well, really since the Depression, right? And, you know, it's, it's going to, it's going to create, as you point out with the Indian farmer example, it's going to create a class of wealth in the Eastern Hemisphere that, you know, that population hasn't hasn't known for a long time or has never known. So and that's that's what I see happening. Yeah, no, that's it. I, 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 you're, you're bang on. And I think it's um, it, it's you know, I had a I remember we had an interview with Daniela Di Martino Booth and ex Fed insider. Right. And you know, her. Um, and she said the Fed, and all the time she was there, the Fed had never even mentioned the word gold once, not one single time. Uh, it's just not on their radar. They just don't get it at all. They take it and for granted. That's where it stems from. Yeah. I was going to ask you um, before we wind up that you, um, miners, now you have a miners journal, um, and uh, it's the mining stock journal that you have. Um, this has to be a big focus for you surely um, now that the gold price is starting to move yeah well my my newsletter focuses on the um the micro cap junior exploration i call them venture capital stocks hmm. and it's it's the riskiest part of, of the sector and um you know over the last couple of years i've started uh presenting ideas mostly kind of intermediate trade ideas in the larger cap mining stocks and the mid caps, um, you know, and, and, you know, I present call option ideas to take advantage of what I think are short term trading opportunities um, in the in the larger, more liquid stocks. But yeah, I mean, what, what we've seen, you know, Newmont mining hit an all time high last Friday, mm -hmm. this past Friday. And so what you've seen is I, I think I think smart money, smart Big smart institutional money sees what's coming, and when they when they buy mining stocks, they're not buying the stocks that I cover. You know, fifty million dollar. If, if a big fidelity mutual fund wanted to, you know, wanted to buy a, a, a small micro cap stock because they saw that you know it has potential to go from a, from ten cents to a dollar, they'd have to buy the whole company to have to have that stock make a difference on their rate of return, right? Because it's such a you know, a fifty million dollar market cap position it would be a, a small position in a big mutual fund. So they go into the large cap stocks like Newmont and Barrick. And when you start to see those move, you know, and assuming that the price of gold and silver continue to go higher, eventually money starts flowing into the mid cap and the smaller cap producers. And and we've started to see that in the last few weeks. Um, and then at some point, assuming you know we have a, a, a longer term sustainable move higher in the precious metals, the junior micro cap stocks that I cover, it's gonna be a lot of fun because that's when they really start to take off. And, and we're already seeing some of these larger cap companies start to acquire the junior companies, you know, A, to, to build reserves in the ground and B, because, you know, they're kind of tapped out on their existing mine, mine properties in terms of expanding their resource. I mean, you got to, with Newmont and Barrick and Agnico Eagle, you got to feed the beast, right? They have to, if they want to sustain as a company, they have to, they have to replace what they deplete. Otherwise, you know, they'll wither away on a vine. And, and that's, 
I, I you know, I, I tell people, you know, it's it's coming at some point. I don't know the timing on it, but when the when the junior microcap stocks start to take off, it's a lot of fun. And we've had you know a handful of periods like that. You know, um, 2000, 2002 to two thousand six was a period. Uh, two thousand eight to two thousand eleven. You know, and we've had two shorter periods since since the mini bear market and the precious metals ended at the end of 2015. You had a, a period uh, between January 2016 and July 2016. A lot of these junior microcap stocks went up five or ten times in a six-month period. And we, we saw the same thing from March 2020 to August 2020. And we're going to have, I think we're going to have another period like that. I think it's going to be last a lot longer it'll be a lot more durable and a lot of these a lot of these stocks that everyone wants to ignore and aren't performing well right now you know you're looking at easy five to ten baggers if not more so so really i think also i think this is really interesting because i think that's an area which which obviously everyone's looking for the the the, the a place that they can be involved with this i mean good god if if an nft can go to god knows how high i mean they be picking up a, a a 10 20 30 40 cent uh you know st something that has value that has ounces in the ground it's a no-brainer it's just really a question of 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 people waking up to the fact and i think one of the things that 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 uh, came out of this nickel thing as well is this whole base metal space suddenly um, all these four, everyone who's, most producers forward sell, right? Forward sell, and, and certainly in the base metal space they do. Um, then that's, that's not, that's going to start reducing. You've got, if you've got JP Morgan openly admitting coming out of that space, uh, and uh, also then the other big players, uh, Standard Chartered, all these guys are coming out um, because it's dangerous uh, to forward sell in this environment. Um, the liquidity evaporates, and that, that could create a huge snowball effect, which is why I think there's a scramble to, to exit this space from, from so, so there must be, I guess, some of the smaller guys probably have, won't be forward selling at this, in this kind of condition. Would that be the case? You know, I, the small cap producers probably will. Um, I think what you might actually see, especially with silver producers, because, you know, that for some reason it seems like the guys that run silver mining companies and are who are advancing the junior silvers, they, they 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 talk openly about the manipulation and about the fact that the metals are you know the Newmont CEO is not going to do that because you know he'd be worried he'd, he'd be you know get the back of the wrist from the U.S. regulators. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what you might start to see is some of the silver producers who are more long-term focused are going to start withholding production from the market. And that that's that's going to be another variable that that'll, you know, trigger defaults in the OTC uh, derivatives market. And so that's that's what I think you'll see there. In terms of the the uh, microcap junior explorers, the ones who are developing properties with resources um, at some point, they're just going to get gobbled up by the mid caps and the large caps. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these companies that have valid gold and silver resource, and I can speak to gold specifically because, um, well, even silver, but, um, you know, I think the values in, in some of the small gold explorers are, are even more extraordinary than in the silver explorers, believe it or not. Um, some of these companies are trading between $10 and $30 per ounce in the ground for bona fide economic resources. You know, in other words, at some point, someone could put in a mine there if they can get the regulatory approval and, and start producing mine, you know, gold. Um, and they're, and they're buying the gold in the ground at 30, 30 bucks on the dollar, you know, 30 bucks per ounce for the gold in the ground. So, I mean, you know, talk about an arbitrage opportunity there. <laughs> well, it takes someone like you, uh, Dave, to, to um, you know, that's years of experience. That's that's huge knowledge uh, and that, that to distill that down enough for somebody to follow. And, and I do honestly strongly suggest that uh, anyone that is interested in uh, in in that area of mining, uh, etc., they should follow you. They should follow you. You've just mentioned some very interesting things. So. Uh, and, and and especially you know now with the price 
us. We see, you know, obviously you can't have a ratio trade of 80, 90, 100 to 1. It's ludicrous. As the price of gold rises, obviously this ratio trade starts to collapse. Um, and then, as you say, then then your your the forward selling probably starts. They start to withholding supply because they're going to maybe afford to hold withhold supply, uh, and and it all becomes very very profitable. So, uh, it's something you've opened my eyes to that. It's something and uh, nothing I really follow myself, but I can see why one would want to look at this space right now. But thank you for that information. <laughs> thank you, Andy. I appreciate that. Well, Dave, you know what? Uh, I hate to, 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 we're running out of time here. Uh, you've been very generous um, and thank you very much. And please, if we can do this again, I'm, I know we only covered a fraction of what we wanted to cover, but it's just when you get two people together who, who love this space, uh, then obviously we can go in any direction. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure I got sidetracked 50 times. So, but thank you so much for your time. But, Really appreciate it. Well, again, you. thanks for having me on. And, you know, anytime. Uh, you're a legend in the industry. So, um, you know, I really enjoy having conversations with you about this. Dave, thank you so much. And people will know where to find you. Investment, research, dynamics. And uh, I'm sure we'll put a link up for you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Andrew McGuire and our special guest, David Kranzler, for another fascinating discussion about gold and silver. And there you have it. That's all we have for you today on another episode of Live from the Vault. So please remember to keep spreading the word about this channel by hitting that like button, sharing, uh, subscribe. And if you'd like to get these episodes as they go live, just hit the bell and you'll be notified every single time. And with that, We'll see you next time on Live from the Vault. See you then.